As you might already know, I love to take particularly electronics apart and see what I could do with the individual components, if I could repurpose them in any way. For example, I took a, just a simple amp and speakers that I found in a headboard of all things. Anyway, I took that and made it battery powered and made it Bluetooth capable, turned it into a Bluetooth boombox. And then of course there's the abomination where I took a, a uh, laptop screen and made it into a three inch thick, but portable battery powered portable screen, I guess, I don't know. The two main reasons why it was so thick, speakers that were from like a 51 inch TV. It sounded pretty good, but not worth it. And also what really made it so heavy was the lead acid battery that I had in there. It's the type of battery you'd put into an uninterruptible power supply. A bit ridiculous. Anyway, so um, I decided to revisit that project and I rebuilt it and came up with this, uh, it's like a picture frame type of monitor. And obviously you can tell it's um, a lot thinner. Yeah, I'm not really finished here. I want to cover that. But I might put like a lithium ion battery here. Which the reason why I didn't do a lithium ion battery on the previous project is back then. I didn't really know how to wire them safely. And I can, I got like several laptops that have little speakers in them. I could probably take a pair of speakers from one of those and put it in here somewhere. Might do that in this video. Might not. I guess you'll see. So yeah. Anyway, here's how I did it. If you're wanting to do this yourself, I might suggest looking up how to make your own picture frames, as this first part is very similar to making one. I start with a 1x4, then start cutting a rabbit joint into it using a table saw. The first pass needs to set the bar for how deep it will be. In one pass, it'll define how big the rabbit will be. All falling passes are just to remove material. This means I need to double and triple check my measurements with where the fence is and how much I raise the blade before I start to cut. One mistake here and I might have to start over. After this first pass, however, I don't have to worry about messing up or going too far. As long as I keep nudging the fence away from the blade a little bit, each pass will continue to cut my rabbit. But I don't move it more than the width of the blade's distance at a time. After a few passes, the blade cuts the very edge of the board and now I have a rabbit joint on each side. I do this on both sides so I don't have to do as many passes later. The width of the frame, or soon to be bezel, is slightly less than half the width of the board. So when I set the blade to cut the width of my frame, I can just pick up the scrap I tear off and run it through again, making sure the rabbit I cut into it previously is against the fence. This gives me more frame to work with and minimizes the amount of scrap. Next I make the final 45 degree cuts. I take very particular care with this part because pretty much everything I do here needs to be precise. Any one piece either not cut at exactly 45 degrees or not cut to the right length can cause issues when trying to join the corners together. If I had a miter saw, I'd use it for this part rather than my table saw. Miter saws are designed for this and can do it better and easier. I end up with two pairs of certain lengths. One pair for the top and bottom, and the shorter pair for both sides. I still had a piece of plexiglass I had cut from my previous video in the same length and width as the screen. So I will use it again to protect the screen. One drawback to this, however, is that this plexiglass tends to reflect a lot of light and can cause a lot of glaring issues across the screen, and even makes a decent mirror when the screen is off. This is totally optional, and without it I could potentially make the whole project about an eighth inch thinner. Not only do I want the corners to meet up square, but also to meet up flush with each other, meaning that if I ram my finger across the front face of the finished bezel, the corners where the pieces will meet up will be flat. So, I lay wax paper over a thick, non-warped piece of plywood and then clamp a frame piece along an edge. It helps if the plywood isn't much bigger than the size of the frame. I then glue the pieces together, not only clamping them together, but to the plywood as well. The wax paper prevents the frame from accidentally getting glued to the plywood. Remember that dried wood glue can be stronger than wood itself, so trying to break two pieces of wood apart that have been glued together would likely just break one of the pieces of wood. I didn't line my pieces perfectly, so the screen has trouble fitting inside. However, some slight chiseling and sanding resolves this issue. I now need to make a cavity in the bottom back portion of the bezel to house the monitor buttons, so by holding the button PCP center on the back of the bottom bezel, I mark where each button will fall on the frame. I've cut every side to the frame to be the same width, but in retrospect only the bottom piece of the bezel needed to be as wide as it is so that it can house the buttons. The other three sides could have actually been thinner and would have made the whole monitor look lower profile. I then use an eighth inch bit to drill pilot holes for each button. Then use a three quarter inch Forstner bit to essentially mill out a pocket inside the bezel for the button PCD to fit in. The bottom of this pocket is flush to the rabbit joint next to it. Now I'm left with the not so straight edge, so I do some chiseling to square this pocket up a bit. Next I use a larger bit to finish drilling my holes. 
The bit is the same size the buttons I'll be using so they can poke through. I also drill from the front of the bezel this time, so if I chip the wood when the bit breaks through to the other side, it'll be on the back side which will not be seen after it's finished. I drilled two additional holes for screws to mount the PCB with. Although in retrospect I could have glued small blocks of wood or something else to use as a media for screws to screw into. This would have made it so no screws could be seen on the front of the bezel, only buttons. I used small squares of wood with holes drilled in them as spacers to put over the mounting screws. These space the PCB away from the wood and allow some space for the actual buttons that show to set in and to move as needed for normal operation. After the PCB is mounted, it holds the visible buttons in place. Doesn't look too bad, certainly much better than its predecessor. Next I clamped the bezel to a square piece of 8th inch veneer, making sure two sides of the bezel meet up flush with two sides of the veneer. I then traced the other sides of the bezel and now have a guide to cut the veneer with. But before I do that, I glue some strips of 3 16 inch plywood to the inside of the veneer. I made the bezel thick enough to have some space between the screen and the back panel, which is used to run wires and for bolts to attach to the monitor stand. The strips fill in some of that space so the screen can't rattle around inside the bezel. So if you're wondering if the screen is held in by a mechanical retention, then yes. Yes it is. I have assembled a hinge from a few pieces of prefab metal, some plastic washers, and a bolt. I use this to help me mark out where I need to drill holes to mount it with. Turns out, I glued a strip of wood right in the way of some bolts. So, using the largest Forstner bit I have, I mill out some space around each hole. Disaster adverted. I'm using those brass bolts used to fasten toilets to the floor for this part, because they have such a flat and low profile head. They are very long, but I will shorten them later. Next, I clamp the back panel to the bezel and drill pilot holes for screws. Since the sides of the bezel are joining in the corners, it's foolish to also put screws in the corners. The pilot holes are to prevent splitting, but even with them, I accidentally split a corner apart. I managed to re-glue and fix it, but it would have been better if I had just offset the screws to begin with so that they didn't fall on top of any joints. After more pilot holes, I fastened only a few screws to hold the back panel to the bezel. I then cut just a little off each side of the bezel. This cuts both the back panel and bezel as if they're the same piece. So now each side of the back panel will line up perfectly with each side of the bezel. This isn't always necessary, but it will really help with making a project look more refined. And then some light sanding to clean up the sharp edges. The controller board is the brain for the screen, and the screen can't work without it. Regular computer monitors have something like this already built in, but laptop screens rely on the computer motherboard to do this job. This board provides an interface for the screen to accept the usual types of video cables like HDMI, DVI, or VGA. This board costs about 35 US dollars and can easily be found by searching its model number. When ordering, it's important to find what brand and model number of screen you wish to use with the controller board you're ordering. This information will most likely be found on a sticker on the back side of the actual LCD panel. The lid of the laptop usually needs to be dismantled to get this, and it will be different than the brand and model number of the actual laptop. But enough about that, let's get back to building. I mark up where I want the controller board and drill holes for its mounting bolts, again using a Forstner bit to make room for this strip of wood for the head of the mounting bolt. I use some space just to hold the board off the back panel a bit, and I need a hole for the cables to go through. Yeah, neat and organized. I decide to stain the frame with a mahogany red and some clear coat. This is approximately a 4 by 6 inch plate of steel that's a quarter inch thick. It weighs nearly as much as the rest of this project, so it should make for a great sturdy stand. Two holes are drilled for the hinge to bolt to, and a third is drilled in between and then threaded using an SAE 4th inch by 20 tap. This is the same thread as the tripod mount on the bottom of the cameras. This project's ridiculous fat predecessor was meant to be a portable tripod mounted viewfinder, so I thought I'd retain some of that functionality. After painting the stand, I begin my final assembly by remounting the controller board, Installing the buttons, dropping the protective plexiglass and screen into the frame, and reassembling, then mounting the stand. I stick these little clear pads on the underside of the stand to protect any surface it sits on. Now I plug the cables from the controller board into the back of the screen and buttons, and then close it up. And that's where I'm at now. Okay, moment of truth. And trippy. <laughs> So it's been literally a year since I made this thing and I've, I'm have i still at this part here where I've kind of just left it open to be added on to. I think I'll leave that for a future video. But for the last year, it's been sitting on my desk next to my computer monitors. I use it to connect my DSLR to, which I use that to record me playing video games or podcasts and stuff like that. So if you haven't done so already, feel free to subscribe. 
um, comment what you liked about this video, what you think could could have been done better. Um, and yeah, hopefully I'll see you in the next one. Thank you so much for watching.